This is called On the Teat. <laughs> yeah, your funeral, this thing. All right, On the Teat. My mother's life came into existence like the central spindles of a spider's web at the moment of my conception. She did not truly exist before my birth, and when she dies, my life will become the moment of a performance when the lone member of the audience turns from the stage. And so I like to curl under my mother's breast and bring my lips to her teeth. It gives me comfort to do this and has since before my memory. She holds me in her arms. Now that I am a man in my 40th year, she is, and she always 30 years my senior, the action has become an, as natural as a limb for the both of us. There is even a place for me, a divot in her arms and stomach, where I belong. It's smooth there, and my body fits like a creature in a shell. My business has taken me to Delhi and Jakarta, where I stand at the head of long tables of men and some women, my hand resting on these tables in these distant locales, distant because the center point of my life rests in her home and waits for my return. In my briefcase, I keep a portfolio of photographs of her. When I'm feeling disrespect from a client over the phone or even across the table, I check open the folder and gaze at those portraits, which she gave to me on Mother's Day. I always return with treats from abroad. I suckle and my mother turns over the carved elephants I buy her and speaks of her favorite philosophical subject, how the span of one's individual memory functions in the same way as a vinyl record, and that there is a distinct moment when the needle is placed by God, she supposes, on the material and crackles to life through the speaker, assuming all goes well, she says, stroking my hair. She claims to have seen my own functional record spring to life for the first time. I have just begun walking, she recalls, which means my brain was in a developmental stage akin to a rock rolling down a steep hill. She began to cook nutrient-rich foods for my developing mind, smoked salmon and handfuls of blueberries, pressed flat. Each morning she gave me a bit of coffee mixed with whole milk. It was all with the idea that she would start the powerful engine of the mind early. Each breakfast was followed by her special blend of math tutoring and recitation practice, wherein I would recite a poem after each time I had properly summed a fraction. And then our lunch, where she would drink a chilled glass of sugar water, and I would lay down with my belly against hers and latch easily to her breast. Even in those early days, I could feel the groove of flesh growing in a place under her shoulder, the lip hooking over my chest and arms, binding me and holding me close. One afternoon, she talks while I'm feeding of how I ought to find a bride, a woman who can care for me the way she does. I laugh a little, milk spittling around my mouth, but she doesn't laugh. She says, there will be a time when we cannot enjoy these long afternoons, and you will be in the world alone, and my heart breaks to consider you out there wandering, lost. I can feel her body shudder around me. The milk in my mouth takes on the salty flavor of tears she's absorbed. It strikes me how weak she feels, how little she's carried me in the recent days. It's important to me, she says, that we find you a mate. And so we audition prospective girlfriends. I retain a service and the girls make appointments. They arrive one at a time to my mother's home and sit on her couch. They are too fat or thin, too pretty or too ugly. One is focused on the pathetic trajectory of her career, while another sounds bovine in her interest in raising a family and moving to the country. One girl plays idiotically with her hands in her lap while claiming her girlfriends convinced her to schedule a meeting with us. She is pretty and I like her fear. My mother sits beside me in her high back chair. She has been taking notes in a composition book but while this last one speaks, she closes the cover and turns slightly, facing the wall. I tell the girl on the couch that she should leave, and tell the other girls in the hallway that they should leave as well. The girl goes without another word, watching my mother all the while. I wonder what she's looking for, a second opinion, perhaps. She doesn't find it. I'm gathering myself to confront the girls remaining in the hallway for a blistering reprisal of their time with us when my mother begins to shudder. I stumble to her feet, pushing my face into her lap, kneading her stomach and breast like a cat. Her shudder continues, deepening, spreading to her extremities. She clutches the arms of her chair. These fucking women, my mother says. I realize I have made the worst kind of mistake. Thank you.